So Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to our Torah study of Parasha Vayelech, and he went. And uh, I'm going to open with a word of prayer. Then Jim and Sue are going to lead us in a song of worship. We're going to study the word and, and discuss it. Amen. So, Avinu Shabbashamayim, our Father in heaven, thank you so much, Tadaraba. You are so good and you are so faithful. You are always good. You are always faithful. You're faithful to all generations. And we trust in you and put our full hope in you. We, the hope is the anchor of our soul. And we are, we are hoping in you. We are trusting in you and your goodness and your faithfulness. We thank you that your mercy and your goodness is surrounding us. And you are surrounding us with your favor as a shield. We come to you and we ask you for your grace, your mercy, your goodness to surround us. That you will protect us during this time as we are gathering together to study your word and to worship and to just dedicate. We just want to dedicate this time to you. Would you speak to our hearts? And we invite you, Ruach HaKodesh, Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and to teach us and to speak to our hearts in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Show us new and wonderful things in your Torah and bless each one who is joining in and listening and is hungry and thirsty for more and more of you. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. So, shalom, and I, uh, I'm going to mute myself. We're all going to mute ourselves so that we can hear Jim and Sue. I'm excited to hear what, what you're going to lead us with in, uh, in, in song. And uh, it's always just good to praise, to praise the Lord. There's such a power in praise you know sometimes we run around trying to solve everything and work everything out but sometimes all we have to do is praise him and he sets ambushes against our enemies oh man all right so i'm going to turn it over to you guys there yeah. got it <laughs> yeah, thank you hannah thank you um yeah so actually we we the, the song we've chosen um, is um, to link in with uh, the Jacob and, and uh, wrestling um, with with the Lord, and he was he was wrestling for the blessing, and so um, and his name became Israel, and so we decided we would choose to sing a song of blessing over Israel tonight. So. You think you probably know it, Hannah. <laughs> Some of you might not, um, but it is a song of blessing over Israel. So shalom, Israel. You, shalom, Israel. You and, and the chorus is shalom, Israel. So it's Israel. easy to join in the chorus, and you may also shalom, know the words as you, as you hear it. But yeah, so I'm just going to start uh, with a short just song, uh, improvise something that will, whatever at least that will come out of the violin over, over Israel and over Jacob's descendants. <laughs>
That was really beautiful. Uh, such an honor and privilege that you um, play that for us. And it's amazing. You're playing it there in the UK and it's playing out here in the land of Israel, you know. Okay. And uh, I really felt the I really felt the shalom of God come like an anointing for shalom to coming over me. I have felt a bit, I don't know, like kind of struggling today to find that shalom and and for shabbat and and uh i just really feel the the shalom the peace of god you know over that over that song it's real anointing i don't know if i told you one morning i woke up and that song was in my head it was like is you guys you it's like you guys were singing in my head one morning when i when, you know when you wake up and before you're really awake and you realize <laughs> there's a song in your head i don't know if that ever happens to you and that was it it was that one so Anyway, it's very, very special. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hannah. Bless you, Hannah. For giving us the opportunity. Bless you. I, I wanted to just start by reading this psalm in the Tehilim, the, the Psalms, Psalm 46. It says, um, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed and the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. It says, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. And then it says, be still and know that I am Elohim. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Yehovah Tsevaot, the Lord of hosts, is with us. Imanu, the God of Jacob, is our refuge. Selah, pause and think about that. Yehovah Tsevaot, Imanu, the Lord of hosts, is with us. Mizgavlanu Elohei Yaakov, the God of Jacob, is our refuge. Amen, amen. So, um, this week, we're going to be continuing along the uh, continuing saga of Jacob, Yaakov. And uh, last week, we, we left off with uh, Jacob fleeing from his father-in-law, Laban. And uh, it's time to go home. Time to go home. God tells him that it's time to go home. And... Um, we talked, we had a little discussion last week about how Rachel stole her father's idols and hid them under her, under, under her seat on the camel. And uh, Jacob inadvertently cursed her with a death curse. And we'll see in this parsha that Rachel actually, actually um, does uh, die in childbirth. So anyways, we are starting in uh, Genesis 32 verse three so i'm going to share my screen willing aha it worked i am so excited this is getting better <laughs> yay okay so i will um somebody's just coming into the meeting so i'll make this a uh, slideshow and you should be able to see it um, better now. No, 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 I'm going the wrong way. Sorry, it's supposed to be at the beginning. There we go. So can you see that the uh, image of, of Yaakov, Jacob wrestling with this divine being? 
Does everybody see it? Somebody just give me a thumbs up. Yeah. Oh, got the thumbs up. Okay. So the name of the parasha this week is called Vayishlach, which means and he sent, starting in Genesis 32, verse 3. So it says, and then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. So we've talked in um, past studies about who is Edom. You know, it says in our English Bibles, Edom, but it's really Adom. Adom means red. It was a nickname for Esau. So whenever you see in the, you know, if you read in the, the uh, chapter in the book of Obadiah about this warning against um, this judgment on Edom, it's actually judgment on the descendants of Esau on the, and it says that uh, Esau is Adom. It means red. All right. So here this week we have uh, the this kind of crazy thing that happens that Jacob wrestles with God. Jacob wrestles with God, and the theme is about wrestling with God. You know, um, Jacob wrestled to the point that his hip was pulled out of place. So um, when I had uh, trouble with my hips, I said it was because I had been wrestling with God for so long that, you know, both my hips were put out of place. Now I have new bionic hips and I'm fine. So <laughs> hopefully no more wrestling matches with Elohim, with God. All right. So Jacob is on his way home and on the way home, he has to pass through the territory of his brother Esau, who had vowed to kill him last time that he had an encounter with his brother Esau. He was like, I'm going to kill you. And so he sent forth messengers before him to his brother. And he did three things. He uh, used appeasement. He sent gifts. Uh, he prayed. He asked God for help and he prepared. He divided his camp into two different camps. So if one was attacked, he might still have somebody left. Well, Jacob was a pretty smart guy, but he was terrified. It says that the messengers returned to Jacob and said, we came to your brother Esau and he's coming to meet you. And there's 400 men with him. So of course, Jacob would be terrified. It says Jacob was greatly afraid okay he was like scared out of his wits because here comes his brother Esau and he had no idea if in the years that he was gone uh was Esau's heart softened or was he still holding a grudge um he he really didn't know and what I see from this is that sometimes in order you know God wanted to take Jacob home to his place of uh, of destiny and the place where he belonged. But in order to do that, he had to face some of his fears and he needed to confront his past. And I think there could be some issues that we have left unresolved in our past that God may want us at certain times to say, all right, now it's time to confront this. You know, and that doesn't mean that we have to go digging around for every issue in our past to, you know, okay, I'm going to resolve this now. But I think that the Holy Spirit can put, um, can, can put his finger on certain issues and say, you know, I want to, I want to bring you up to uh, a new level. I want to take you to a new place. Um, before we do that, you need to deal with this because this issue was left unresolved there's no closure. It's not in a good place. So we're going to need to deal with it. And sometimes that raises a lot of fears in us, but we need to confront our fears and, um, and face our past and overcome them and deal with it. And once he had dealt with it, then God could take him on. All right. And so this is what Jacob did. He divided the, um, you know, he, he was quite a wealthy man by this time. He had a lot of flocks and, and herds and camels. And so he says, you know, if Esau comes and attacks one camp, then the other camp uh, may escape. So um, he was smart in that way. And then what I like this is 
he was preparing for the worst, but expecting the best, if you know what I mean. And what he did is he kind of said, God, you said, you know, he, he kind of spoke these promises back to God. He said, oh, God of my father, Abraham, God of my father, Isaac, he's, he's leaning on, he's depending on this generational uh, covenant that has been made. He's not coming to God just as Jacob, but as the God of Abraham and the God of, of Isaac. And you said to me, return to your country and to your family, and I'll deal well with you. Oh, it's like, you know, we, we can go to God and say, God, you said, you said you would restore health to me and heal me of all of my wounds. You said you would restore to me double. You said you would restore my fortunes. You whatever whatever promise that God has spoken to you can say, God, you know, it doesn't seem like it like that's coming to pass. You can go to God and say, God, you said. So he said, Jacob said, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies that you have shown your servant. But he says, deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him. He was honest with God. And he said, I'm afraid of my brother, deliver me. And it says, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I trust, my shield, the horn of my salvation and my stronghold. So we can go to God when we have fears. We had this little song that we used to sing to the kids. It goes, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. I will trust in you. You know, it was one of those songs. We used to play it always in the car on these tapes that had the word to, to music. So they, they kind of like memorize it with the music. And that was one of the songs. And so it's one of the things we need to do when we have to confront things that cause us to be afraid. We say, when I'm afraid, I will trust in you. I will trust in you and and so he says um and then again jacob's saying again you said god you said i will treat you well and make your descendants like the sand of the sea well how's that going to happen if esau kills me you know so he's going back and kind of um reminding god of his promises and his faithfulness to to the covenant and so jacob um prays to god he divides the camp he sends gifts over to esau and then it says and jacob was left alone now the word used for alone is levad levad and um it comes from a hebrew word boded and boded can mean single boded can mean just one uh, boded can also mean lonely and in fact, uh, the lockdown and the quarantines during COVID are called bidud from this same word, meaning, um, you know, you're going to be alone. You, you're, you're in quarantine. So it's called bidud. And there were trucks that used to drive around the towns in Israel playing music and just to encourage people that were in lockdown or in, in quarantine. They were in bidud because it could be very lonely. And so... You know, times when we are alone can be lonely, but they don't have to be. We can be alone with the Father and not lonely. And Yeshua himself made sure that he had time alone. It says after he dismissed the multitudes, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was still there alone. You know, Yeshua was always being mobbed by the crowds. And, and, he needed to get by himself, praying just to be alone with the Father. And we were talking about that last week where Yeshua said, you know, I, I'm alone, but never alone because the Father is always with me. And for us to remember that even if we are alone, we are never really alone. The Father is always with me. It's so important that we have alone time with God, that we find some way to carve out alone time with God, where it's just, you know, just me and God. And even if all we're doing is just sitting there together, you know, it's still important that we have that time. It just says, be still and know that I am Elohim, where we can just sit and commune together, read his word, worship, pray, and, um, and, and just be alone with God. And, and uh, I have a lot more alone time than I used to. 
because I'm a semi empty nester now that my kids have grown up and Navi went off into the army. And even though he's back home now, he's not really home because he's working and doing other things. So now I have a lot of alone time. And sometimes that gets to be a, a challenge. And I think that um, we need, we do need a balance. We do need a balance between alone time and uh, social time. We all need, um, you know, as we were learning together with Marsha on the King of Kings discipleship about relationships, we all need relationships. We all need friendships and, and Kayla and community. But it needs to be balanced because we also need alone time with God. And Jacob was alone. And it was when he was alone that he encountered God. It says, Jacob was alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. So in Hebrew, if we look into the original Hebrew, it, say, it does say a man wrestled with him. This was uh, Ish. Ish just means a man. So it was a man. Now, this is another time that we see um, a physical manifestation of God. We talked about when the Lord and two angels came to Abraham when he was in his tent and they ate with him. And then they went down to Sodom and Gomorrah. That was in Genesis 18. And so the Lord and the two angels appeared as men. He thought they were men and he went down and offered that they come and eat with him and everything. So uh, it's really interesting that there are all these physical manifestations of God in the, if we want to call it the Tanakh or the, or the uh, Torah, the Old Testament. And because one of the principles of faith that Maimonides um, created says that God is only a spirit. God is a spirit and he cannot manifest at, in, in, in flesh, in reality. And I think that was a reaction against Yeshua. But the truth is that there are several, you know, the, the one in Genesis 18, this one, the one with the fourth man in the fire, with the three Hebrews that were thrown into the fire. So many, um, several times there are ma physical manifestations of God. It's, this is like this divine messenger or oh, in Hosea, uh, it, it calls him an angel. It says, um, in Hosea 12, he took his brother by the heel in the womb, and in his strength, he struggled with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. So it says he was struggling with God and struggling with an angel. And uh, in the end, he calls the place Peniel, because he says, I have seen God face to face. So this was, it was God, and it was a man. It was a divine being that he is wrestling with. All right. Oh, some believe this was a manifestation of Yeshua. All right. And um, <laughs> so then Jacob has, says this great line that I think that we need to um, repeat to ourselves over and over again. OK, because he said he saw that he would not prevail against him. He touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But Jacob said to him, I will not let you go until you bless me. I will not let you go until you bless me. I know that there are people who have been uh, waiting on God, hoping on God trusting in God for a long time for some for some blessings and and I believe that we've got to become really um, stubborn is not the right word but stubborn in a good sense that we say I will not let you go until you bless me if we know that this is the will of God um, I think that we need to be careful we don't give up too easily you know, Yeshua told the um, the story of the persistent widow who just came to the judge over and over and over and over again and finally gave in to her. And he said, you know, how much more 
when you when you go and you ask over and over and just just like this is this tenacity i will not let you go until you bless me and in hebrews it says therefore do not cast away your confidence which has great reward for you have need of endurance so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. So this is telling us we can't be give up people. We can't we can't be people that just said, well, you know, it hasn't happened yet. So I guess not going to happen. And I just give up. You know, we cannot lose heart if we haven't seen the fulfillment of the promises yet. But say, I will not let you go, like not letting go of God until we receive the blessing. And um you know, when Jacob's hip was wrenched out of its socket, he probably was in pain and probably did not have the strength to fight anymore. Probably all he could do was hang on to that guy's neck for all his might, just cling, just cling to him. And I think that there are times when we may not feel strong enough to continue fighting and all we need to do is just hold on, just cling. You know, it says you shall love the Lord your God and, and cling to him. Just wrap our arms around his neck and saying, I am not letting you go until you bless me. Uh, uh, just, uh, I'm not sure if this morning, no, yesterday morning, my daughter sent me this song. And it was so good because I think we all have a tendency sometimes to lose heart. In, you know, when we don't don't see things changing and we don't see things happening and we can tend to give up or lose heart. And the song was called Don't You Give Up On Me. And it was God speaking to his child saying, don't give up on me. This is not the end. Um, you know, we're just getting started. I still have blessings for you. And it was just the perfect song for this parasha. And it was um, Brandon Lake actually was singing a perfect song for this part of Shana. It was the perfect song for me today to say, hold on and do not give up on God. Continue to hope. And this has been the word of the Lord to me for, for a little while is don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. Because when we lose hope, we can just start to despair and be very discouraged. And that's kind of a dangerous place to be. So, you know, it says in Psalm 42, why so downcast, oh, my soul? Put your hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. You know, we shall yet praise him. Weeping lasts for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen. And here in Hebrews 12, it says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. We all have a race to run and we need endurance. I'm trying to build up my endurance by walking and because uh, I'm hoping to do a tour next year. And the tour guide said, you've got to be able to like walk, you know, so you got to have the stamina, you've got to have the endurance. I'm like trying to build that up. And so we need to be able to run our spiritual race also with endurance. And that means we don't give up when there's opposition or things get tough, we hold on, we cling to God and hold on. All right. And then um, the angel says, ask Jacob um, kind of a strange question. He says, what is your, what is your name? What is your name? And uh, I, I'm sure that he knew his name, but he asked him, what is your name? And Jacob answered, Yaakov, that's his name in Hebrew, is Yaakov. And I believe there was a reason that he asked his name. And that was because he had to face up to who he had been. He had been a grasper. He came out of the out of the his mother's womb grasping onto his brother's heel. He was a taker. He was looking for what he could get. He was a deceiver. He deceived his father, who he's supposed to honor, according to the Ten Commandments. And he deceived his father and said he was Esau in order to, to, to take the blessing. And he was a grasper and he was a deceiver. And he wouldn't be, um, you know, he was not above uh, cheating or, or doing something crooked 
in a, in, to get what he wanted. And that was his name. That was his name. The name uh, Yaakov, it, it carries that meaning, a deceiver or someone who is crooked. And I believe that that angel asking him, what is your name meant? I want you to face up to who you have been. And sometimes we need to do that as well. Sometimes we're in denial and we're trying to justify why we have acted the way we have or what we have done. But the best thing that we can do is face the truth because it says you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. It's not the truth about somebody else, but it's the truth about ourselves. I remember uh, hearing a story by Joyce Meyer that she told one time. She said because of the abuse she had endured as a child, she was so negative. She's just a very negative, critical, hard to get along with person. And she blamed her husband and she blamed her children it was because they didn't do what was right and they didn't listen to her and they didn't help her enough and all of that. The one time in her prayer time, um, she was complaining about all of this. And she said that God spoke to her and said, uh, Joyce, uh, you know, um, Dave is not the problem. <laughs> and she was like, well, who would it be then? You know, there's just the, there's just him and me. And and she said that when she when God showed her the truth of um what what she was really like, you know, just harsh and and negative and hard to get along with and rebellious, she said she just she cried for three days straight, just facing up to who she had been. And then that was when God then started transforming her and so once Jacob once Yaakov could face up to who he was then God could start to transform him and that's when he said your name will no longer be Yaakov but Israel for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed like that makes no sense in English whoops just a second no that just makes no sense to me at all in English. It's nice, but doesn't doesn't we don't see what is really being said here until we look into the Hebrew. So I hope that you can read a little bit of Hebrew. And even if not, I'm just going to show you here. So I showed you what Yaakov's name means from the word Ekev, which means a heel. But this is the word for Yisrael. Shalom Yisrael. This is Yisrael in Hebrew. I It doesn't come with a hyphen. I just put that in to show you. It's like two words. El means God, like Elohim. All right. And these two letters, the sin and the resh, it sarita, it says that you have struggled or wrestled or striven with God, El. So that's where they get this word, Yisrael. It means Israel. This is where Israel receives her name. The name of the nation is given right at this moment to say, you have struggled with God and prevailed. Israel is a nation that struggles with God, that wrestles with God, and is still wrestling with God until this very day. But the angel says to him, your name shall no longer be called Yaakov, but, but Israel, because you have striven with God and man and have prevailed. Okay, but here's the thing, is there is another meaning to this word. Yeshar, you got it, Marsha. So if we move, just move the dot over, um, then we get the word instead of Yasar, it's Yashar. And Yashar means straight honest or righteous and giving him this name means you are no longer going to be a crooked deceitful man you are now a righteous man you are straight you are honest with God I think that is is so beautiful ah shalom we have people here from South Africa. Shalom to South Africa. I know that is really, really beautiful. That's what I think one of my favorite hidden Hebrew secrets from the book that Sue and I are working on. <laughs> so 
in Hebrew, we don't say, what's your name? We say, okay, to say, um, Marsha, I would say, Ech korim lach. to Edward, I would say, Ech korim lacha. It's different for a man or for a woman. What we're saying is, Ech is how, korim lacha, how are you called? How are you called? That's the, literally, they're saying, how are you called? And this is what he was saying to Jacob. You're no longer going to be called a deceiver. You are no longer going to be called a crooked man. You are going, your name will be, you are going to be called Yisrael. Sar also means a prince. So when people say his name, they're going to say, they're going to say, how are you called? And he'll say, I'm called a prince of God. I'm called righteous. I think that is, is so beautiful. Sar is also the name of a, a, a minister. Like in the Knesset, uh, it's, it's a minister, someone who ministers to God. And so all of this, you know, Hebrew always has a lot of meanings contained in the letters and the words put together. So he receives an entire new identity. This is a beautiful um, butterfly card. Liat took photographs of the butterflies when we had a uh, migration of thousands of butterflies that came through our village and they were just everywhere on all of our little um, purple bushes. So Liat took photographs and she made them into greeting cards and um, that's my daughter, Liat. And the scripture on it says, therefore, if anyone is in the Messiah, he is a new creation. The old things have disappeared and look, all things have become new. And so after Yaakov wrestled with, the, with this divine being, with Yeshua, the Messiah, he became a completely new man. He became, a, he had a complete, completely new identity. And I, I do believe that God wants to do this for us as well. It says in Isaiah 62, verse 4, I will change your name. You shall no longer be called Azuva, that is forsaken, nor shall your land anymore be called Shemama, desolate, but you shall be called Hefziba. My delight is in her, and your land is Beulah, that means married, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. I know that this uh, promise was given to Israel. But I believe that God also wants to do it for us. He wants to give us a new identity. If we have been forsaken, if we have been abandoned, if we have been abused, um, God wants us to receive through him a completely new identity, to be confident, to be bold, to be prosperous, to be healthy, to be someone that knows that we are loved. You know that that beautiful song that came out, um, Jaira. You know, it's not there's no J, okay, so it's not Jaira. It should be Yaira or Yir E, but it's like I'm already loved. I'm already chosen. I'm already cherished. So that is our identity. But some of us still, you know, God is working on us, and uh, we still need to to kind of identify with our identity to really maybe maybe Yaakov maybe Jacob had a time of adjustment as well where he needed to realize he's a new man he's a new creation he doesn't need to act like the way he acted before but but I believe something's really happened um quite instantly with him you know I don't know about your salvation experience maybe sometime you can share your stories but I know that uh, for me, there were some things that happened miraculously immediately. It, there were some ways that I was transformed just like that, without any effort, without any intention about it. I was just changed. And then there are other things, you know, like God's still working on me about, you know, 30 years later. 
And I'm sure that's the same for, for most of us. So then um, this is really interesting because Jacob says that he's call, he called the name of this place Penny L. Penny L, he says, because I've seen God face to face. Yeah, looks like we've lost her. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she yeah, she was having some connection issues uh, before we started. Um, so hopefully she can get back on. Still recording, everyone, by the way. Speaking of um, Yashar, uh, did, have you heard of the, the in, I think in the scriptures, it talks, um, it talks about how Joshua was in the book of the upright, or someone is in the book of the upright. It means upright, right? Yashar? Can anyone speak to that? And also, uh, I think in Deuteronomy 32, it says Yesharun. Is that, is that a, like a deri Yesharun, a deri derivative of Yashar? Oh. oh, I can't hear you. You someone's muted. Can you? Oh, maybe Hannah can speak to that. Anyway, back to okay. Turn it back. Uh, invisible fence. We can't hear you. Uh, I said, here comes Hannah. She's she's reconnecting. If you look down. Yeah. Okay. Am I back? Yes, you are. Oh, yay. I'm so sorry. Huh? I, uh, thank you for covering for me. I just gave <laughs> myself a hot spot because uh, all of a sudden I had no internet. So I'm just on a mobile hot spot. So hopefully that will work. Hopefully, hopefully. Okay, let's, um, did we look? Ah, oh, you guys are all still there. Yay. Faithful. Hannah, one. Quick, yes. <laughs> quick, quick question, Hannah. Uh, while we, you were missing, uh, we filled in some time. I asked them, Yeshirun, is that is that a derivative of Yash, Yashar or something? Yeshirun? Yeshirun from Deuteronomy 32? Yeshirun? It yes. could be. Yeah, I mean, it's it has the same letters. So, yeah, it could be. Okay, so that's yeah. another name for Israel, I guess. Yes, right? yes. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, maybe what I'll do because of the, um, I'm thinking maybe maybe because of the uh, internet problems, maybe I will not, maybe I won't share my screen anymore. What do you think, Edward? Would that help with internet if I don't share the screen? Uh, it, it may, yeah. Well, I think so because um, it had the more things you put up, the more uh, yeah band, bandwidth you have to use. Okay, so so we'll just walk through it with the scriptures. Sorry, you won't see the pretty um 
PowerPoint that I made, but um, that's all right. So we were just talking about facing tr truth, struggling with God and man. He called the place Penny L. All right. And that, that slide that I was on was saying that he said, I have seen God face to face. And yet God said, you can't see my face and live. And so Yeshua said, whoever has seen me has seen the father. So I think that is a connection there, very strongly to show that that divine being was Yeshua. And that's why he could say, he's seen him, he's seen the father. I've seen God face to face. All right. And so he crossed over and he was limping. Have you ever heard the expression, never trust a man without a limp? Anybody heard that? That's from Tommy Tanny's book. I think there's some truth to that. You know, until a man has been, until a man has been broken, you know, until a man has really gone through some stuff, until a man has, has really wrestled with God through that long night of the soul and, and been broken of his pride and his self-sufficiency and, you know, he, he comes out of it with a limp. I mean, there is a cost to wrestling with God, right? But he, he comes out of it with a limp. But that means he just knows he's he depending on God. He knows now that he depends on God for everything. And interesting that it says to this very day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that is on the hip socket. And that's true. That's considered um, non-kosher. So even unto today. Okay, so we're at Genesis 33. And uh, Jacob lifts his eyes. He's had the wrestling. He's been transformed. He's now Israel. He lifts his eyes and he, he sees Esau coming. And he's, he's terrified. But here what happens is Esau runs to him. He embraces him. He, he falls on him. He, he kisses him and he weeps. You know, obviously he has forgiven him and there is this beautiful reconciliation between brothers at the end um, they actually come together to bury their father and so he lifts his eyes and he sees these the women and the children and he said who are these with you and he says the children whom God has graciously given your servant even in this this phrase you can see that he he, he knows that everything he has is from God it's not like oh look what look what I got for myself you know it's like no and it reminds me of that verse it says um um for it is god who gives us the ability to create wealth and it says don't say look at all this that my hands have made for me knowing that everything that we have is from god and i think that the way of proving that we believe that everything we have is from god is by giving back to him what he asks for which is the which is the tithe and that proves that we say, you know what, all this that I have, I know it comes from you and I'm giving back to you what you have asked me to give back. All right. And so Jacob, Jacob is so transformed that he's now a giver. He's no longer a taker. He's no longer grasping and seeing for what he can get. You know, I think there's kind of two kinds of people in the world. There's those that are out there trying to see how they can make a difference. What can they give? What can they do for somebody? And then there's the people that are just takers. You know, they're just always scanning to, to see what can I get out of this? What's in it for me? And this is what Jacob was like. But now he is like, please, I have to take this. He says, if I have found favor in your sight, because he says, I've got enough. I don't, I don't need this. He said, no, please take my blessing because God has dealt graciously with me and I have enough. And so he urged him and he goes, so that's one of the, the signs of transformation is that Jacob has been transformed into a giver. And I believe that's one of the signs that we have been transformed as well is that we're no longer selfish self-centered people grasping after everything that we can get but we are transformed into givers because god is a giver he is a good good father who loves to give gifts 
to his children. And he loves us so much that he gave his very best. He gave his only son so that we would have eternal life. So God is a giver. And the more we are transformed into his image, the more we become givers. We just, you know, it's just like, what, what can I give? What can I do? I'll tell you, I just the Holy Spirit is so good. The other day, I woke up and I was having my devotions alone time, okay, alone with the Father. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, um, you don't know what people are going through and you need to be like, um, you need to almost like somebody going with an oil can like there's rusty hinges and squeaky places so you need to go with the oil can and spread your oil to make it easier for them so your oil of joy the oil of kindness the oil of cheerfulness and and so I just thought, okay, that kind of was in the back of my mind that day. Okay, I'll try. And then I decided with every email that came in, I thought I'm going to, to, to try and do something to say something extra that might maybe give a little bit of oil onto their squeakiness or their hardship or their whatever they're going through and my sister had happened to uh have written me uh, a message that day and and I didn't think much of it but I just tried to kind of encourage her she's going through a hard time and she wrote back and she said you have no idea how much I needed to hear those words today and so you know the Holy Spirit will will <laughs> thank you guys <laughs> but, I mean that was just that day you know it's not like every day I wake up it's like ah oh, what can I say you're nice to somebody but spirit because the Holy Spirit will tell us um this is kind of the focus for today or you need to do this today or or warn us don't do this and I mean, it's not always so clear cut sometimes we're wrestling and struggling you know Jacob's whole life really was was such a struggle I mean, everything that he went through and it didn't end after he was transformed. You know, once he received his transformation into Israel, his struggles didn't end. In the next chapter, his daughter's raped. You know, his 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 uh, favorite son, he thinks, has been killed by wild animals. You know, just all of it. His whole life was a struggle. And so I don't think our struggles end when we come to faith in Yeshua. And and I think that that was really misrep misrepresented to me when I came to faith. I came to faith in this non so much for me. But there was this kind of theology that once you come to faith, um, you know, you're just going to have joy and peace all the time and and just love joy peace just life's going to be so wonderful and i i kept thinking what's wrong with me because i came out of so such a troubled situation that it wasn't going to be solved overnight and we need to know that just because we are struggling with god and 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 man um it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with us man all right benny i see your message I will, I will do that. I'll send you my prayer request. Thank you. Thank you, brother. All right. You know, and you know, sometimes the, what the problem is, is that we don't always know if we're struggling with God or our flesh or the devil. <laughs> you know, it says you do not. not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers of darkness and wicked in high places right and sometimes we don't really know oh, i'm struggling i'm wrestling well i'm am i wrestling with god or the devil you know are these principalities or 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 is this, god, or is this just my flesh am i just struggling 
struggling with, with my own flesh. And so that's sometimes the challenge because um, we, we don't always know the source. Like Job said, Job felt like he was, he was wrestling and he, he didn't know. He didn't know where the struggle was even coming from. Amen. Is the internet okay? Are we still okay? Edward, you says it's going in. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, we'll try to keep. Okay. We'll try that. I'm sorry for the internet. I don't know. Are you there, Hannah? Everyone hear me? Might have lost Hannah again. If she's using her phone, like it might have a cap or a data limit and might it might go really quick on this Zoom call. There, there she is. Are we back? There you are, Hannah. I'm going to shut off my video just to see if that helps you out a little bit. Okay. All right. I'm so sorry. You guys are very patient and persevering. So I'll just go through really quickly while we still have internet here. Um, I'll just go really, really quickly. There's just a couple things left. One is the rape of Jacob's daughter, Dina. And um, what I want to say about that is, I wish I had my screen to show you. Could you hear me now? Good, Phyllis. Thank you. Um, what I wanted to show you on the screen in the Hebrew is there's this kind of a bit of a, a mystery in that a, youth, a male youth, a youth that is male is called a na'ar, okay? And a youth that is female is called a na'ara. Um, whenever we put the, the hey at the end of the word, the a, ah, it makes it feminine, okay? Like yelled is a boy, yalda is a girl. So na'ar is a boy, na'ara is a girl. And what's really interesting, because there are no mistakes in the Tanakh, in the Torah, there are no, the scribes are very, very careful. And if there's any mistake made in the Tanakh, they actually have to bury the entire Torah scroll and start all over again. So it's not a mistake, but when they're referring to Dina, um, it leaves that hay off the end of her word. It doesn't call her a na'ara, it calls her a na'ar. And I think that there is kind of a little hidden message in there 
because it says that Dina, the daughter of Leah, went out to see the daughters of the land. And I think by calling her, um, taking away the, the hay off of, off of her name, calling her a Na'ar instead of Na'ara, I think what it's saying is she did not um, act in a proper way as a woman should in those days by going out by herself to see the daughters of the land she was putting herself at great risk you know a woman in those days could not just go out like that alone because it made themselves vulnerable and so she was not um honoring really her femininity and her vulnerability as a woman by going out and so shechem who it says he was the son of Hamor. Hamor actually means a donkey. So Shechem, the son of a donkey, um, grabbed her, violated her, raped her. But then he said he, he, he loved her and wanted to marry her. Well, when her brothers heard what happened, of course, they were very grieved and they were very angry. And they said that they, they had done a disgraceful thing thing it says he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter it should not have been done and um, Hamor the donkey the father of Shechem said please Shechem loves um, Dina please give her to him as a wife and he's basically saying let's come into an alliance together we'll give our daughters in marriages to your sons and you give yours to us and we'll we'll be kind of in covenant together dwell and trade and you know it's going to be a good arrangement the problem with that is that god had forbidden them to do that in deuteronomy 32 it says you're forbidden do not intermarry with the people of the land so they're forbidden to do that and they know that but they were deceitful. This whole theme of being deceitful is just running down the generations all the way from Abraham being deceitful. And then Isaac, you know, she is my sister. And then Jacob deceived his father and the sons of, of Jacob. I mean, this generational sin is a, is, is a big thing that I think we need to deal with. And so um, the sons of Jacob, spoke deceitfully it says and they said you know what we would give our sister to you but we can't because you're not circumcised and we can't give our sister to a man who's not circumcised but if all you if if your whole tribe will be circumcised then we'll give our sister to to you and we'll become one people and we'll be in alliance with you and we'll trade together and so they say okay and they, and they and they do this all the men of this tribe uh become circumcised and on the third day when they were still uh, in great pain two of the sons now i think all of the sons of jacob were in cahoots on this if we look at it all of the sons were in on this none of them were innocent but two of them specifically shimon and levi they came in and they slaughtered all the males. They killed Hamor and Shechem. And they, they grabbed Dina out of Shechem's house. And they grabbed her. You know, we never hear about Dina again. And Jacob rebukes his sons. And he said, you know, why have you done this? Now they're, you know, you've made trouble for me with the people of the land. And they said, should he treat our sister like a whore? You know, what, what I see in this, though, is, is I believe there's a real danger in um, letting our temper and our anger be out of control. You know, it even says, don't make friends with an angry man, for he'll set a snare for your soul. And sometimes we can have um, a problem with anger. Our anger always needs to be, anger is God-given. Anger is an emotion that God has given us to know when something's not right, when there's an injustice, when we're not being treated rightly or someone else isn't. But it says that we need to bring this, our emotions under control. It says that a man without any self-control is like a city with no walls. 
and, and anybody can come in and, and attack. So we need boundaries. We've been talking a lot about boundaries lately. David gave us a, a testimony about boundaries the, the other week, which was really great. We also need boundaries around our emotions. You know, it says a fool vents all his feelings, but a wise person holds them back. And I know that's not very popular because we're supposed to just vent everything. But the Bible actually says that a wise person keeps control over their emotions and will even hold things back. And, and to just let our anger rage out of control is like, you know, letting a fire that should be just warming up the, our food to rage out of control and burn down the house. And, you know, on Jacob's deathbed, he brings up this incident. He never forgave them for this. And he talked about how cruel their anger was. It was really a terrible thing that they slaughtered all these. They tricked them, they deceived them, and they slaughtered all the men for the sin of one man. And uh, really, really a stain on the household, on, on the sons of, of Jacob. All right. And uh, all right, that that is about that is about it. God again reaffirms that uh, his name is no longer Yaakov. His name will now be Yisrael. And he says he called his name Israel. And God said, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. And the land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I give to you. This is in Genesis 35. Uh, 12. So very clear that the, the covenant for the land goes through Jacob. And um, then Rachel dies in childbirth. It says there's a lot of name changes uh, throughout here. Abraham's name, it was changed from Avram to Avraham, Sarai to Sarah, uh, Yaakov to Israel. And now Rachel gives birth to a boy who she was going to call Ben Oni. And Oni is sorrow. And, uh, but his father changed his name. You know, it just shows how powerful a name is. A name comes with a destiny and a, a change of name can mean a change of destiny. So instead of using the name that Rachel wanted to give him, son of my sorrow, his father called him Benjamin, son at my right hand. And so Rachel died. She was buried in uh, Beit Lechem in Bethlehem. And uh, Jewish people tried to go to the Kever Rachel, to the grave of the tomb of Rachel. But it's um, pretty dicey. I'm not sure if Jewish people can get into Bethlehem or not. I think what they have to do is uh, rent a, a, a like a Palestinian car and go in with a car and Palestinian plates. I don't think that anyone with Israeli plates can go into those to those areas. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that, but I don't think so. And um, so Jacob has 12 sons. And then um, Isaac dies. It says Isaac breathed his last and he died and was gathered to his people. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. So again, Jacob and Esau come together to bury their father. But how good it is that they reconciled before this happened. They didn't reconcile just to bury their father, but they reconciled truly. And, and then it just goes to the genealogy of Esau, who is Edom. It says Adam red. We talked about that. And again, it says this is the genealogy of Esau, the father of the Edomites. Esau, again, at the very end of the parsha, it says Esau was the father of the Edomites. Avi Adam, Adam red. So uh, you can read the book of Obadiah to read about the um, judgment against Adam, against the descendants of Esau. We talked about that, the, the terrorists that come from, from uh, these descendants, kind of warlike tribe that is, is continues, even though Esau and, and Jacob, Esau and Jake, Jacob and Esau reconciled, but yet their descendants are still at war today 
and the descendants of Esau are still killing, um, you know, shedding the, the blood of their brother Jacob on the streets of Israel today. So that song that you sang was so powerful. Shalom Israel. We need peace. We need peace ourselves, a peace that passes all understanding in all of our wrestling and struggling. We need the shalom of God and we need peace in our nations, in the nation of Israel and the nations of the world. And I, I just think that no matter what we go through, um, you know, we may go through more struggles in life. You know, Yeshua said, in this world, you will have trouble, but be of good cheer for I've overcome the world. And so that's, I think, um, wraps up the parasha for today. I think the themes are really about holding on to God, clinging to him, not giving up, being uh, per persevering, you know, in faith to see the blessings, to wrestle for the blessings and say, I will not let you go until you bless me. And just the transformation that God can do in our hearts. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for having your uh, uh, patience with all the technical issues tonight. I don't know why, but um, would any, anyone like to share uh, something? Maybe um, is there something that you have been uh, wrestling uh, with God about? in the recent times is there something that you are struggling with or wrestling with um is there anything that comes out of this out of this parasha oh my goodness there's still most of you hung in there till the end i guess what we said about being enduring and having endurance really hit home because you're all still here <laughs> so i think that's great um, I just would like to give time for some um, discussion. And so I want to mute myself. And if there's anything, oh, the recording's still on. Thank you so much. You guys are faithful. All right. So I am going to shut off the recording right now because what we share at the end is a little more personal. We don't want it recorded. So if you want to take part in our fellowship afterwards and our um, discussion of what God has spoken to us through this uh, Torah study, then just join us on Zoom and uh, sign up for our Torah studies on voiceforisrael.net. And uh, it's just been a, uh, a joy to share the Torah with you tonight. So Shabbat Shalom and Shavuot Tov. And I'm shutting off the recording.